Well, of course, when you're tracking in the studio, you're either imagining a potential audience or you're not really thinking about an audience at all. But at a live gig, all those eyes and ears are right there in front of you. So mm -hmm. how is your singing affected by the presence of a live audience? Does it tend to psych you up or does it ever inhibit you? Gosh, uh, it could be any way, any, any different day. I'm like the weather. You never know what you're going to get. So <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's inspiring. Sometimes it's frightening. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, everything in between. As, as a rule, I'm a much better performer now than even I was back then. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't really enjoy performing for the first year at all. I really didn't like it at all. But I knew that I wanted to get my music out there, and that was Kind of the only way to do it. So I'm I'm much more comfortable with it with it now. That song in particular is because it starts a cappella um, and is so intense. I actually kind of really enjoy the fact that I'm singing all alone. There's yeah. there's not many environments or in a club environment that you go into and the person just starts standing up singing. It it you know is akin to the traditional Irish uh, folk songs yeah. and Appalachian folk songs. Uh, and I really wanted to capture that that uh, naked, sparse intensity. It's interesting that you say, you know, Ireland and Appalachia, because to me, you know, Celtic music, country music, and folk music are just so butted up against each other. I mean, mm -hmm. it just doesn't take much to tip a song. And it, it could just be a matter of an Irish accent or the way you play the fiddle or, you know. <laughs> but because it's all just organic music of the people, and which is why That's it right. survives and it's so beloved. Um, and of Absolutely. course, we should point out, of course, that was a Japanese audience, by which I mean it was silent when you started. It could have been a studio recording for all anybody knew, because, you know, as the Beatles found in Beatlemania with all the screaming, they'd, when they toured Japan, it was the first time they could hear themselves on stage. <laughs> the audience was like, you know, they, they were respectful, so they, they want to hear every note, and then yeah. they'll show you their appreciation at the end, as we heard. And that sounded like sort of a small club environment about how many bodies were there that night. How about... 40, maybe 50? Yeah. That's the intimate thing, because once again, back to the doors. I mean, you know, that the London Fog there, they had that intimate club thing, and then when they tried to translate it to a, a stadium, you know, it didn't always work. Yeah, I can't imagine that that would. And, and that song, I, I don't know if it would work on a stadium level. There's something really naked about it. I, I love uh, doing that song in a small environment. There's there's a couple clubs where, you know, the front row is barely three feet away from me. Just, um, it can be uncomfortably silent, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I want to mention to our listeners that they should also check out the studio version of that song from your debut album, because it's, it's like I was telling you off air here, you know, I think Alison Krauss, that sort of angelic mm -hmm. sound is a little bit more of a touch of that on that one. But um, I went ahead and played this one because it was live. Somehow you managed to work auto-tune in there. I don't know how you did it, but I was, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I was I kidding. <laughs> That was my point. I mean, you went to you toured there with four people, two instruments, no bass, no drums. It was all very exposed, so those better be good guitar players and good singers because that's all you got on stage. That's what I think I love the most about live playing uh, that I've grown to love the most is that every performance is different. There's always going to be mistakes. And, you know, as much as I wouldn't like those mistakes to end up on YouTube, some of them do, and you have to live with that. I don't, I don't want every note to be perfect because then it's not me because I'm not perfect and, and the human experience is not perfect. I, I love those uh, bumps and carbuncles and, and moments that you go, oh, that wasn't perfect, but the feeling was there. And so particularly with Live in Japan, I, I, I don't listen to it that much um, because sometimes I go, oh, it wasn't my best notes, but the, the heart is there. And, and yeah. so that's cool that you chose that. Yeah. Well, we have a couple of mutual friends who are both past guests of this show that would be mr robert wrist and mr Yay. william funt Yay. Um, robbie bill yourself and christian are all involved with a facebook group which has resulted in an abundance of video content for us all to enjoy uh, so could you please explain for us the concept behind that group sure it's called theme music and uh, the administrator creates a theme per week and all the participants can post videos that fits in with the, the theme. So this week it's songs with exclamation points. Mm. You can cover a song or you can do an original. Um, as a rule, most people do covers, and it's pretty fun to see what wacky covers people come up with. Robbie is endlessly entertaining. <laughs> um, and some people are using it as a forum to stretch out and write some of their very first songs. It's really diverse. You have everything from total amateur singing to karaoke, to total professional studio versions with 
you know, file pet pro videos and special effects and the whole nine yards. Mm. So it's, it's incredibly inspirational because, you know, music needs to be, at least to me, I think it should be of the people, for the people, by the people. I really do. It's so inspirational to see somebody, you know, in March pick up a guitar for the first time and then, you know, six months later they're making an F bar chord. That's awesome. Mm. I am so inspired by those people. I love it. And you said it's once a week, so, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year, so it doesn't take mm-hmm. long before you've got a ton of videos. Yeah, exactly. And the videos you and Christian created for theme music uh, can be found on YouTube and your website. Most of them were casually done, but the quality is always high. And I recommend everybody check out not only those, but also all the videos you've done in support of your album tracks. Uh, one of those videos that I highly recommend is the one for the title track of your One Drop of Poison CD. That song has a pretty interesting premise. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, um, it's basically, I think it's a Chinese um, story about a woman who gives poison to her husband every morning, and if he doesn't come home in the evening to get the antidote, he will die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that's kind of my tongue-in-cheek uh, a little story about falling in love sometimes with someone that maybe at the time you don't really wish you loved, but you do anyway. And so the husband is not aware that this is being done. Is that right? Exactly. So yes. he's like, yes. why do I, I, I didn't go home tonight. Why do I feel like crap? I don't feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm actually, yeah. I'm actually not going to play that song, but I recommend people find the video so you can hear the song and see the visuals, which are pretty striking simultaneously. The next song I am going to play is from your Let's Go Together CD. What you did with this one was capture a vintage sound, but instead of taking the easy way out and just covering something from that era, like How High the Moon or something, you wrote an original song in that style, which is, of course, much more challenging. Uh, Christian, who arranged the backing vocals, he describes it as being in the style of the Andrew Sisters, which it is, but considering the guitar work on it, to me it sounds even more like Les Paul and Mary Ford. And Mary Ford, yeah, we've had that comparison a lot. And this song is actually, um, it gets placed a lot. It's been in a, in a few film and TV spots, and uh, people really love this song for that reason, I think. Well, what it does is it, it makes you think, am I supposed to know this song? Have I heard it before? Is it is it on one of those Les Paul uh, compilations mm-hmm. that I just missed this one? Because it, it sounds mm-hmm. so, you know, authentic, but it dates back to 2004. So let's listen to that from Let's Go Together. This is Cersei Andrews Ford with <laughs> with You Are the Stars. <laughs> Stars I find in heaven, the lucky number seven, the night in which the gypsy sings a tune. You make my little world complete, the smell of roses sweet, and everything is new. You are the stars, you are the stars, you are the moon. You are a silent wish come true. You are the day, you are the night. You are my one and only light You are a quiet canyon path A figurehead and mast Upon a ship that sails all over sea You are great plains under a sky Alive with fireflies And everything is new You are the stars You are the stars You are the moon You are a silent wish come true you are the day, you are the night, you are my one and only Oh 
So when you're multi-tracking harmony vocals like that, do you prefer to sing each part in isolation, or do you like hearing the other parts in your mix as you're singing to help with the blending? Hmm, depends on the part. I, I do it both ways. I don't really have a preference. Um, I'm really good at doubling myself, so blind doubles. Uh, I, I generally am pretty spot on with my um, uh, diction or phrasing. Uh, the way I move through a note is going to be the same almost every time. So um, I'm, I'm game to do it either way. Sometimes it's important for me not to hear the other vocals. Uh, if the part's particularly difficult, sometimes I, I need to not hear the other parts and think of it as a melody. Um, I want to mention another track on that album, which is called Not the Marrying Kind. This is about a girl whose boyfriend is telling her he's not the marrying kind, so she can't expect him to go there but yet he still expects her to stick around and, you know, shall we say, indulge him. Um, mm-hmm. The, the punchline being at the end of the song, she tells him she's decided that she's also not the marrying kind, and you know, he basically needs to get lost, you know, mm-hmm. giving him a taste of his own medicine, as they say. Um, now, your lyrics reference a mother advising her daughter you know, not to settle, uh, which reminded me of a well-known song by Smokey Robinson that goes like this. When I became of age, my mother called me to her side. She said, son, you're growing up now. Pretty soon you'll take a bride. Mm -hmm. And then she said, just because you become a young man now, there's still some things that you don't understand now. Before you (laughs) ask some girl for her hand now, keep your freedom for as long as you can now. My mama told me, you better Better shop around. around. Now, so you've both used this conceit of a mother giving advice. But the funny Mm -hmm. thing to me is in his song, the mother is advising the son to be the exact type of guy that the mother in your song is telling her daughter to stay away from. You know? Well, <laughs> so, uh, so definitely some that. conflicting maternal advice happening here. And I have to say, I think your mother is the wiser of the two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think uh, she actually in the first verse goes to a psychic and in the second verse, the mom and the psychic says, your man's a player. So she learns that, then the mom reaffirms that, and then by the third verse she says, okay, well, maybe he's not the guy for me. Right. It's just, you know, I just, it struck me as I was listening to it, you know, that about the, you know, the Smokey Robinson and the Miracles song is, hey, yeah, you know, don't be tied down, you know, but who, yeah. are, who are these girls you're not being tied down with? Is it really fair to them? And then the flip side of it is your song. So I just thought that they married up as a nice companion it, to each other. It is interesting. Yeah, yeah, but she's not telling him to be a cheater. And I think in, in my song, he's the guy's a bit of a rover. And so that's oh, yeah. Nice. So yeah, it's I think kind it's of good advice to shop around before you hitch up. It is. It's just it was just you both use the conceit of mama told me, you know, yeah. my mama told me you better shop around. Yeah. My mama told me not the marrying kind. Just, I just connected the songs in my head and then I actually went and played Smokey song. Right. And it just made me laugh. Well, those songs are very important to me. And one of the things about older country music as well as soul music, you would have those stories that would have a twist on the end mm. and it would have some sort of um, social uh moral story, which I love. I love yeah. that usage in, in music. Oh, yeah. When you have a song that, you know, it's, it's got a nice vibe and it's groovy and it's cool, but there's also that extra element of something you can actually use in the lyrics besides, you know, like, let's all do the twist. And there's, there's something oh, else. Yeah. Like, you can think, you know, you're, ha- you're having an experience in life and the, the song lyrics will occur to you and it actually benefits you, then that's a total bonus. Mm-hmm. Well, now I want to shift over to your Moody Girl album. Uh, this was a very deliberate effort to explore some different musical terrain. Uh, there's a track on the album with a Brazilian feel called Sugar Mine. Is there anything you want to say about that before I play it? I mean, was, was the music uh, Christian's idea, or was it? did you originally think of it, or was it? No, actually, uh, we weren't sure how we were going to do it. That whole record was very spontaneous. We, we only had a few sketches uh, done, and most of the players had never heard any of the songs before, so... We made a lot of those decisions live in the studio the day that we recorded them, and that was one of the decisions, I thought, when we were going through it, rehearsing it, wouldn't it be interesting to try and make it a bossa? And we did, and it came out pretty well. It did. It reminds me of uh, Bill Bruford recording with Yes. They used to do that, too. They'd show up and see what nice. happened. They did, yeah. I think, Superior and Catru one day, and what she called a, quote, good day in the studio, unquote. 
you know, <laughs> in retrospect, looking back on their career. Superior Catrice, yeah, that was a good day in the studio. <laughs> uh, well, let's check out your good day in the studio uh, from Moody Girl. This is called Sugar Mine. Well, it's nice that you can toss out a track like that without having to base your entire career on that one style. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, next we've got yet another stylistic departure. Uh, this one I'd classify as having a Billy Holiday quality. So we're talking about going back to the 30s, at least musically. There are some anachronistic elements to the lyrics. You know, reference the Grateful Dead, for example. Um, this one's on your latest album, Dumb Luck. And it's about aging, and considering that you and Christian really aren't that old, I'm wondering if you might have been a little premature with this track. Was it more about just having a good idea for a song? Maybe so. Um, but, you know, we're, we're in our 40s, so uh, that's, it's a time to consider, particularly as a woman. I mean, I'm a feminist, so I think about, you know, is that skirt too short for me? 
<laughs> that's <laughs> important. And uh, the funny things that happen to you as you get older. My mom was older. She had me as an older parent, 35 when she had me. So um, having older uh, parents really makes you think about how you traverse the whole experience and can you do it gracefully and with humor. And that's that's what I really wanted to capture. And, and to say that, you know, old people got a lot of nice stuff to to say and still contribute to the world and just because you may not look good in that miniskirt anymore doesn't mean you don't have something to contribute. Well, you know, uh, baby boomers have sort of redefining what it is to be old. I mean, look at Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and, you know, all these people that are you would have never imagined Absolutely. when they were in their 20s that they would be out on stage in their 60s and even 70s rocking. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And so, you know, their expectations are different now. I mean, I remember Joe Perry saying one time that, you know, as their fan base would sort of rotate, he would just say, you know, people reach a certain age where they feel like they're not entitled to rock anymore. Like, oh, it's inappropriate. But yeah. it isn't, you know. So people need these absolutely. reminders. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and listen to that song from her 2013 Dumb Luck album. Here's my guest, Cersei Holiday, singing about getting old. Oh, 